Today, it's my pleasure to talk with Rihanna Leek about hormesis and brain performance and resilience. And we'll talk about the definition of hormesis, which is essentially adaptive stress responses and how, what they are with a focus on the brain and neurons and how they might be tapped into to enhance the function and of the brain and perhaps protect against certain brain disorders. Um, Rihanna is currently Associate Professor of Pharmacy at Duquesne University. She also has an adjunct professor appointment in neurology at University of Pittsburgh, which is where she did her PhD work. So Rihanna, why don't you start by giving our viewers and listeners some background on you? Sure, sure. Um, so it's an associate professor of pharmacology, but I am in a school of pharmacy. I just wanted to oh, okay. correct that. Well, um, anyway, thank you for inviting me to be here, Mark. I feel a little bit like a fish out of water compared to all the other notabilities that you've had on. So I've had a relatively sort of modest um, career trajectory. And as we had just discussed, I can talk a little bit about that. So um, I, um, well, I actually grew up in Bangladesh and then we came to New York when I was 14 years old and I was very mm -hmm. sort of shocked at how um, disrespectful the kids in high school were because I went to a public high school in New York City, in Queens to be exact. Um, so, um, but eventually I uh, went to Barnard College in New York City and um, there I met Ray Silver who studied circadian timing systems. And I, you know, I just sort of realized at that point, hey, you know, I really have to start to study and, um, you know, buckle down because when I initially heard that I was gonna come to America, I just went, wow, I don't have to study anymore because we all know from all the TV shows that the kids don't do that much work in America. And that really turned out to be wrong. And so my high school years were a little bit misspent. But in college, about the in about midway through college, I realized, you know what, this stuff of, that Ray Silver is teaching about circadian timing system kind of really speaks to me because, you know, I understand sort of at a very intuitive level how you feel when you're tired versus when you're well rested. And so I joined her lab, I volunteered in it initially, and then after I graduated, I spent a year in her lab because I was really sort of uh, very... Um, very, uh, I, I, I appreciated her sense of management and sort of honesty with her students. She was a very frank person. And so I spent a year there and I applied for graduate school at that time. And I went to the University of Pittsburgh to continue to study circadian timing systems under Bob Moore, who had discovered the suprachiasmatic nucleus along with another group um, in 1972 and described it there. And I thought that was a sort of good fit. It was heavy anatomy focus, which is what I liked. And then in graduate school, um, after I finished graduate school, I um, stayed on with Bob, just like I had with Ray, <laughs> you know, and sort of, again, I was sort of very devoted to my superiors, to my bosses, and I thought these scientists are really great people. And I stayed with Bob for an additional one year, and then September 11th happened, and I, my husband got mobilized, and so I became actually very happily a full-time housewife for a few years. And when he was demobilized, I joined the lab of Michael Zygmunt. At the time, I wasn't a very competitive person because I just had these small papers in brain research on anatomical findings that are still being cited, but weren't very sort of hot, if you will. So Michael Zygmunt graciously accepted me into his lab and he was doing all of this really interesting work on forced exercise. So forced limb use by putting a cast on um, half, you know, one, one arm of the animal and so forth. And so that sort of that got me also interested in the stress response. And um, one morning I was reading an article from the Wall Street Journal over my cup of tea that talked about hormesis. And I think this was sort of Calabrese's big breakthrough. And it, it struck me again instantly because in the article, and I remember this very clearly, it said that anything that triggers a clean sweep of the cell without causing long-term damage should be beneficial. And I said, well, that's very sensible. And so I went to Michael Zygmunt and he was very sort of open to new ideas. And I said, let's try this in the 6-hydroxy dopamine model that you've established for the last few decades. 
he it it was it what it's one of the few models that's been around for so long you know for, for parkinson's disease for parkinson's disease yeah. that's right so it causes oxidative stress yeah. it really creates a parkinsonian animal without causing the disease itself and that's the of course the drawback of all models none of them really cause the disease itself because we don't know what the triggers are and that's sort of held back the field a little bit but at any rate, so we tried some studies with um, sort of uh, treating the cells and animals with very low doses of 6-hydroxydopamine to understand if that fortifies them against subsequent exposures. In other words, a form of preconditioning or what's nowadays called conditioning as had been very well studied in the stroke field and um, or whether they're weakened by it. And, you know, it sort of goes back to very old um, sort, sort of sayings by Nietzsche, like I, in German, he said, was mich nicht umbringt, macht mich stärker. And that means what does not kill me makes me stronger. And it's not unlike what Paracelsus had also said in the 15th century, which was, again, in German, it was, um, um, uh, the dose makes the poison. And if you translate it, it says, everything is, there's nothing that's without poison. It's only the dose that determines whether or not something is poisonous. And sort of just bringing all of those things from the from uh, very sort of broad ideas into the cells and animals was a great interest of mine at the time. And um, then what happened is that I got more focused on the in vitro cell culture studies, which on, on transformed cell lines. And those also have some drawbacks because they're transformed, they're growing in culture and you know, sort of a very primitive tool that we have available. I was unable to finish too many of the animal work because I developed a pituitary lesion at the time. And so the in vitro oh. stuff was easier for me. But at any rate, what we uh, found was that um, there are there are there are um, defenses in cells that are not always the same. So in other words, there's no sort of master switch and magic bullet. But if you treat cells with low concentrations of various things that are considered poisonous, like 6-hydroxydopamine and uh, proteasome inhibitors, then you can generate an adaptive response that where the cell tries to overcompensate in the opposite direction, and this makes it stronger, able to survive the second hit, if you will, better, which is at a higher concentration. And um, so, you know, I just, um, I, I expanded those studies a little bit into trying to understand what the molecules were that were responsible for these preconditioning like effects. And they always varied. And it was sometimes glutathione, sometimes it was um, copper zinc superoxide dismutase, which is called SOD1 as well. And we did that through the use of inhibitors. So, and so, so antioxidant enzyme. Yes, yes, which is very sort of reasonable of the cell to do. Yeah. And I think. At the end of the day, I guess I have lots of faith in the ability of evolution to sort of shape the response to stress in such a way that it's a lot of times adaptive. And even when the response is to kill the cell, I think that is also in many cases adaptive because you can remove dysfunctional cells from the organism. You can save your energies and not waste it on cells that are sort of hopeless, you know, and, um, and you can also prevent um, uh, oncogenic transformation. And so there are very good reasons to kill cells, not only during development, but also in adulthood. And that's why we have so many neurons to begin with in the brain, you know, sort of an excess of neurons. I, uh, I was, um, yesterday I was watching a video on early evolution of life and, and one theory is life on earth started in these hydrothermal vents yeah, in yeah. the oceans. Yeah. And so the, the first living cells were bacteria like cells and they lived in, uh, in the absence of oxygen. Yeah. Anaerobic. And in those conditions in the ocean, there's a lot of toxic things. Yeah. There's, there's metals like iron, selenium, nickel, zinc, which uh, uh, most people, if they look at their multivitamin, like this, 
Anyway, if I look on here, it has iron and selenium. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, iron and selenium can be very toxic at high levels. Yeah, yeah. And, and during evolution, uh, not only did cells evolve to be able to resist the toxic effects of things like these metals, but they actually took advantage of the metals. And for example, antioxidant enzymes, there's certain antioxidant enzymes that have selenium, yeah. this toxic metal in the enzyme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's another aspect of the evolutionary aspect of hormesis is that um, not only did cells evolve ways to protect against the various stressful environmental conditions, but they actually took advantage. I, I had a podcast with um, Bindu Paul at Hopkins, who was kind of the main person in Sal Snyder's lab working on hydrogen sulfide, yeah, yeah. which is a gas. And she talked about these toxic gases and these hydrothermal vents, there's actually a lot of hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it can be toxic at high levels. Carbon monoxide, too, I didn't, is in these. And so, actually, our, our cells, brain cells, produce hydrogen sulfide and carbon monoxide and nitric oxide. So those are kind of some yeah, yeah. examples going all the way from the earliest origins of life all the way up to our, our functioning brain. I think it makes sense that we took advantage of what was in our immediate environment. And if you fast forward several million years, you know, when you think about mammals that came about, they and and their relationship with plants, you have also mentioned in your papers um, how a lot of plants have to produce toxic substances, but of course we co-evolved with them and we, you know, due to food scarcity, we would eat plants as well as animals, which are, you know, sort of safer to eat if they're not rotten, you know, but the, the, the ingestion of plants has made us depend on them for, um, you know, low levels of substances that could be construed as poisons, including spices, right? So, yeah. um, and caffeine and nicotine, which have been shown to be protective against the risk of developing some neurodegenerative disorders. And so I, that is also, that's also been um, sort of kind of, I think an example of how we can manage to stay in a sustained state of ad adaptation, right? Yeah. And when I say that, I don't mean chronic in the sense that it's going on night and day, but that you know you sort of meet the day with a rhythm the burst of cortisol and catecholamines and then you shut down during the night time and we've observed that very much in our preconditioning models that you need a period of recovery and yeah. rest in order to fortify defenses and build up again you know like bone and muscle for people who work out they don't get built during the bout of exercise, they get broken little micro fractures and tears, micro fractures in your bone and tears in your muscles. And those have to get repaired when you sleep. And um, so you need that interval. And people people have actually observed this with 6-hydroxydopamine as well. If you give two 6-hydroxydopamine injections simultaneously, one in each hemisphere, you will worsen outcomes in a pretty big way, you know, as opposed to what we've shown in my lab several years ago, if you inject one hemisphere with 6-hydroxydopamine and you wait three days while the animal is sort of forced to use the other side, the uninjured side, and then you inject the second hemisphere, mm -hmm. then you can prevent the toxicity in actually a surprisingly um, dramatic way. We were sort of surprised at the degree of protection that we saw in vivo. We, yeah. we did similar experiments with um, something called 2-deoxyglucose, which is a, a form of glucose that essentially it imposes a metabolic stress on cells, kind of similar to a, a mild ischemia, at least with regards to energy. And yeah. we found the same thing. We we do, what did we do? We did once a day, which you know, it's kind of 
intermittent in a sense. It's kind of like exercise, right? You exercise, say, once a day, and then you recover. Yeah. But anyway, so we had this 2-deoxyglucose then recovery and did that for a couple of weeks. And then in the, we used the, another neurotoxin, MPTP, uh, in our model and found that this kind of preconditioning yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is beneficial. And um, let, let, let me return and, and kind of dig deeper into the chemicals produced in plants. And yeah. so there's a lot of evidence that vegetables and fruits, particularly the skins of uh, fruits, uh, are beneficial for health. And the conventional thinking a long time ago was, well, there's antioxidants that actually sop up free radicals in the plants, things like vitamin E maybe, or C, which can help sop up free radicals. But um, it turns out that a lot of the chemicals that in the st controlled studies have been done that actually been shown to have beneficial effects, uh, like sulforaphane, which is in broccoli sprouts, or you mentioned spices, curcumin, which is in turmeric, or caffeine even. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, their normal function in, in the plants, as you mentioned, is, seems to be to dissuade insects and other organisms from eating much of them. And um, so they have a very bitter taste. If you put any of these things on your tongue, yeah. caffeine, cur they'll have a bitter taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then, you know, we talked about antioxidant enzymes in cells, the, the evolutionary way cells protect against free radicals. Uh, some of these chemicals in the plants stimulate those, the production of those enzymes, the genes encoding those enzymes. And you've done a little work on, on uh, a transcription factor called NRF2. Yeah, just a right. You want to talk about that a little bit? It's yeah, it's yeah. known to be potently activated by sulforaphane. Yeah, so we haven't inhibited NRF2 to make sure it was the mechanism that was involved in Tarun's study. And we we were trying to test the hypothesis that if you if you treat a population of cells with a severe enough with a high enough concentration of paraquat. Um, then you should be able to kill off the most vulnerable group and the ones that stay behind should hmm. theoretically, because they've resisted something already, be resistant again. Yeah. Or they should be weakened. We don't, we didn't really know, you know, what we were going to see. Um, I mean, there, there's really several possibilities when it comes to preconditioning. First is that, um, you know, there's no effect of the first hit on the second. So that's when those two hits will be additive and though you will see no statistical interaction between the two variables, that is the presence or absence of the first hit and the presence or absence of the second hit. The second possibility is that you get sensitization to the stress. So the first hit and the second hit are not additive, but the first hit sort of potentiates the response to the second hit. So that's either called stress synergy or stress sensitization or stress potentiation, there's many terms for it. But the main thing is it's not additive. And the other option is that um, you get preconditioning. So the, with the first hit, if it's sublethal, the second, the, the, the effects of the second hit are reduced, the toxic effects, and the cell survives. So they're conditioned or preconditioned. And you can think of that as sort of stress tolerance, stress adaptation. And it's a form of hormesis, in my opinion. Um, the difference being is that you have two hits. The second one tells you whether the first one was any good <laughs> yeah. or was it a yeah. bad hit. And then the other option is that is what we were testing. And that is that when you apply a high enough concentration to kill a fraction of the population, the ones that survive, you'll see how they respond. So, I mean, we thought that they would get progressively harder to kill because in Parkinson's disease, you have this... Um, um, so it's a negative exponential curve of cell loss in the substantia nigra. So in the beginning, it's very rapid. And then as you, as you sort of enrich the population in the less vulnerable cells, it slows down, the rate of loss slows down and it sort of goes towards the asymptote. And so we checked this with Paraquat and 
we thought, you know, let's give ourselves the best chance of seeing enrichment in the resistant survivors. And so we used astrocytes. And they're, of course, they're responsible for building scar tissue in areas of huge amounts of damage. And they'll survive being rotated violently on a shaper overnight. Like they're the only ones that stay attached to the bottom of the flask. And so we use the cell type. And um, what my uh, wonderful graduate student, Tarun Patia, he's now at Emory, he found that um, the cells that survive a hit of paraquat do not respond to the second hit with additional cell loss. And we were trying to understand how this happened. Now, we did not inhibit NRF2, although NRF2 was activated. So not only was the protein phosphorylated, it also was in induced. So in other words, transcription and translation were increased. Um, what we, we didn't, we were not terribly successful at RNA interference in the astrocytes. We were using pharmacological inhibitors. We inhibited other things like glutathione and the kinase pathways that are very well studied like ERK, AKT and junk. And we did not see any abolition of the protective effects. It's been a struggle for us to get these vulnerable, sort of the population of cell that's enriched in the really resistant, sorry, the resistant survivors to get them to respond to the second hit. Another graduate student of mine, Amanda Gleixner, she had tried to deplete them of glutathione and that did work. In other words, that sort of unmasked the toxic effect of the second hit. She was using different kinds of um, toxicants at that point. And of course, glutathione is very old and it's present from 0.5 millimolar to 10 millimolar concentrations in various cells. And there's a very good reason for that with oxidative phosphorylation creating so much sort of oxidative stress, you know, that um, it made sense that the cells will depend on glutathione for, um, for yeah. active defenses against second hit. So you're not just it's not just a passive phenomenon where, hey, I didn't respond to the first hit because I don't even take up the poison, so I'm not going to respond to the second hit. This was, you can unmask the vulnerability to the toxicants by reducing glutathione levels a little bit. So yeah, I mean, that doesn't answer your question about NRF2 very much, but it gives the audience sort of a background on what we were able to find and those four possibilities that you'll, that those are the four ones that I can come up with. Um, yeah. There's others out there. <laughs> um, I think it's good to, now to talk about the fact that neurons in the brain and, and all cells are normally and almost continually exposed to some level of stress. You mentioned oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, which generates a lot of free radicals. And in the case of neurons, since they're electrically active, similar to muscle cells, essentially when you're using your neurons, uh, it's a stress yeah. on your nerve cells. And there's uh, depolarization of the membrane, sodium influx, calcium influx, increased actually mitochondrial respiration in response to activity, which makes sense because the cells got to produce more ATP. Yeah. to support its function. And those free radicals that are produced, uh, as everybody knows, are, can damage molecules in cells. And there are many ways that the cells deal with this. They mentioned antioxidant enzymes, but there's also a lot of repair mechanisms. Yeah. For example, uh, DNA in our brain cells right now is being attacked by free radicals. But it's okay because we, the cells have uh, DNA repair enzymes that they recognize the damage and, and they remove the damage base in the DNA sequence and they replace it with a pristine one. And so it turns out, and there are other mechanisms, there are protein chaperones, heat shock proteins, um, which have been studied a lot as their name implies. Uh, the production of these proteins in the cells increases in response to heat. Actually, that's how they were discovered. Um, there's a, in, in previous episodes, we've talked about autophagy, which is a me mechanism to 
remove damaged molecules and mitochondria and perhaps other organelles. And in the brain, when our neurons are active and under stress, whether it's um, activity or 2-deoxyglucose or even exercise, physical exercise turns out will increase production of neurotrophic factors such as BDNF. So anyway, the point is that the cells have many different, the neurons and other cells too, astrocytes, have many different mechanisms to uh, mitigate stress and, and prevent the accumulation of, of damage. So um, I guess, uh, why don't you talk, you've done quite a bit of work or some work on heat shock proteins. Do you want to kind of expand on heat shock proteins? Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it, uh, we did a little bit of work in heat shock proteins. Again, Tarun did that work and we were, we did a few things. So initially we were just inhibiting the heat shock proteins with pharmacological various pharmacological antagonists with different mechanisms of action. And we found that toxicity was greatly enhanced of um, things like proteasome inhibitors and um, other toxicants. And it depended on the cell type too. So just to kind of bring in brain region of interest really kind of matters a lot. And I think that determines the signature topographies that you'll get in these neurodegenerative diseases that is the different brain regions, even if they are all exposed to a particular insult, whatever the disease trigger is, they don't all respond in the same way. Um, depending upon the defenses that they have available. And I don't know why some neurons would would have greater defenses than others. I'm not sure exactly what determines that other than sort of just to say that it depends on the proteins that are expressed, but what determines that is not really very clearly understood. But at any rate, so um, these defenses that you mentioned that the um, various neurons and other many cell types that are present in the brain have will, um, will determine, I think, the outcome to the accumulative damage, the cumulative damage that you experience over the course of your life. So you had mentioned various kinds of stress. I would include psychological stress in that, um, oxidative stress, protein of misfolding stress. And the way that I like to think of it is that, you know, if you have a cell and it's a, it's a sink in your kitchen and you have the faucet open and you have a small drain, you have this sort of watery cytoplasm where things are sort of teeming with various molecules that are interacting and you have to make new ones because some of them get damaged and they have to go down the drain. But the drain, the drain can be varying sizes, right? The faucet can be, you know, um, on, on very high, like a fire hydrant, you know, or very low. And so it's the rate of synthesis and um, production of various molecules vis-a-vis -vis the rate of removal that really matters, right? And so if that's yeah. imbalanced, then the sink is sort of filled with um, toxic um, aggregated proteins and uh, you know free radicals and other things. Whereas um, if the drain is, if the clearance system is nice um, as it would probably be in a younger individual than me, you know, if it's a really good clearance system, then you're not gonna have the buildup of the damaged proteins. And those are, of course, the workhorses of the cell, or at least some of it biased towards that. I'm sure people would argue that carbohydrates and lipids are also completely essential. But, you know, proteins do a lot of work. And of course, they're encoded by DNA. And to keep them intact, you need good DNA repair systems. And, you know, actually, while you were talking, I was wondering if it's been shown, maybe you know the answer, whether DNA repair systems and other defense systems wax and wane with night and day. You know, so we're certainly, oh. you were talking about neuronal activity and we're certainly active in our heads at night as well. There's no reprieve for neurons. They continue to um, show electrical waves when you put, you know, electrodes yeah. on the head. And so I don't know if maybe some neurons take a break while others are sort of active and I don't, nobody really knows the answer to that question. Like, you know, this, this, is, this is an interesting question. Um, so when I was at NIH, 
uh, I collaborated quite a bit with Will Bohr, yeah. who's actually the grandson of Niels Bohr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Will is an expert on DNA repair and also does a lot of work on these uh, premature aging syndrome, progeria yeah. syndromes. And so, you know, I'd talk with him early on when I was there, I'd talk with him about DNA repair. And he's always talk about, you know, what the proteins are and whatever, base excision repair to remove a, a, a base damaged by a free radical and so on. And, and I'd ask him, well, uh, are there signaling pathways that enhance DNA repair? Okay, and it turns out <laughs> there was nothing known. And there was actually a Nobel Prize given for discovery of DNA repair mechanisms uh, a number of years ago. And it turns out there's very little known on that, Hard, virtually nothing, which is surprising. You know, what, what signaling pathways might increase the production of a certain DNA repair enzyme? So we did some experiments with him, uh, a couple of things. One was, um, we actually did exercise in, in mice. And so we just compared animals that had running wheels in their cages for a couple of weeks to animals that didn't, took out, um, I think cerebral cortex and his lab uh, uh, measured levels of DNA repair enzymes and actually they have an assay for DNA repair. And bottom line was there was enhanced DNA repair in the animals that exercise regularly. And we also looked at BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which it's very important <laughs> protein in learning and memory, in formation of new synapses, in stress resistance of neurons. And we know the signaling pathway for BDNF uh, involves CREB, and, and so this transcription factor CREB. And so we found that BDNF and CREB upregulate a particular antioxidant enzyme. So I, I guess my point is these repair enzymes, as you would imagine, are regulated. I don't know if they're regulated in a circadian manner and, for example, go up during sleep or yeah, I mean, you were collecting the tissue probably during the animal's sleep phase and the animal's probably running on the wheel during the dark phase when they tend to yeah. react. Not that's well. true. Yeah, so maybe that's why DNA repair systems were up. I mean, it's it's very expensive to collect animals across all times of the day, so people generally can't afford to do that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, I, I would just, uh, I think we're on the same wavelength that it's highly likely that yeah. that these are regulated in it. In fact, so I had Sachin Panda yeah. in one of the podcasts to talk about circadian rhythms. And, you know, it, it turns out there are hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of genes that are regulated in a circadian manner. Uh, in fact, there seems there aren't many that aren't, <laughs> but I, in my reading in the literature. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, that that sort of brings up this point that because the because of the light dark cycle, we are we have evolved to kind of predict when there will be danger and when we'll be more active and more mm. exposed to maybe free radical stress. Huh. Right? Yeah. So that kind of goes back to the theory of allostasis, which is like sort of predictive homeostasis where the reason you don't just react like a thermostat but you prepare for an environmental challenge and I think that is preconditioning in a way that's sort of a def one of the yeah. definitions of preconditioning is to prepare for the future and that's what circadian rhythms that are endogenous can help us do is prepare for the you know onslaught of all of everything you have to accomplish during the day and then rest at night when you have that recovery interval so in a way we are sort of unless we're lying in bed all day <laughs> you know we're prepared we are continuously being a little bit stressed every day and that's not that you know life is stress right I mean you won't be stressed when you die I hope you know <laughs> nobody knows the answer to that question right but you know to be alive is to be 
placed under varying degrees of tension. Yeah. And I think that sort of evolution has kind of built on that, you know, and uh, allowed a, a, and just sort of takes, whittles away sort of the weak cells, you know, um, the, the yeah. weaker sort of survival of the fittest. I, I don't want to get too deep into that, but um, I think the ability to prepare for future, for the future, the prudent, if you will, the prudent cell, if you will, is the one that will manage to survive very well. And even Hans Selye, um, he described conditioning factors. He's sort of the father of stress research, if you will. He described conditioning factors that depend on diet, on prior exposures to stress, you know, sort of stress history and on uh, and genetic factors. And so, you know, that these are all very sort of commonsensical things that like, you know, scientists, I think, can study in the lab, um, like you have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, if there's any magic bullet and I don't, and I don't think there's one single magic bullet except perhaps exercise, right? Because uh, of course <laughs> we're not designed to, you know, be couch potatoes every single day. Yeah. You know, so. I think let's take a, a brief intermission now and, and, and we're going to yep. we're going to focus the rest of our conversation on implications of hormesis for brain health and performance. And we can get into exercise, something we've worked on a lot, intermittent fasting, intellectual challenges, yep. and then also potential clinical applications. There's some interesting things with not preconditioning, but post-conditioning, like imposing a mild stress after some, say a, a brain trauma or something, and or even remote conditioning that yeah. apparently, you know, if you induce stress on one part of the body, there are signals that somehow get to other parts of the body, maybe even including the brain. So how does that sound? We'll take a brief yeah, thank break. Thank you for agreeing to have an intermission, Mark. I will be right back. Thank you. OK. So how, how might we tap into these evolutionarily conserved adaptive cellular response systems to perhaps improve brain function um, protect against disease. Well, we talked a little bit about exercise, and I mentioned that this neurotrophic protein BDNF is increased in response to exercise, and that that is known to be uh, BDNF is critical for learning and memory and for formation of new synapses. And there's um, there's evidence that. Uh, in addition to increasing BDNF levels, exercise can do other good things for the brain. It's, um, for example, in the, in the case of uh, regulating mood, exercise is a really good antidepressant effect. And I've actually experienced that myself where I had some injuries and surgeries and I'd normally had a lot of running yeah. mountain bike riding and and when I had that happen you know in the ensuing weeks and months actually my mood went way down um, you know so exercise is a, a stress on the whole body it's some stress on the brain actually we can measure levels of certain um, genes and proteins that are known to respond to to stress and they can go up in response to exercise. So that's kind of a practical yeah. thing. Exercise is great for your brain and, and probably some of the benefits are through these adaptive stress response pathways. Another one is intermittent fasting. And this goes back to evolutionary considerations. Uh, I've made the case and, and others have the same kind of thinking that food scarcity was a major factor in driving evolution, perhaps one of the most important factors. And we had to, organisms had to be able to get 
food in order to survive. They had to compete in harsh environments where food was scarce. And so it turns out that during fasting, uh, some of these adaptive stress response pathways we've talked about, autophagy, um, we haven't actually looked at DNA repair, but we've looked at mitochondria, there's increased production of proteins that kind of beef up stress resistance and enhance the function of mitochondria. One of these we've uh, published a number of papers on now is called CERT3 or CERT2 and 3. It's a, called a protein deacetylase. It removes acetyl groups from um, lysine residues and proteins. And anyway, it can affect the function of proteins. So those are some examples of kind of everyday things people can do. Um, why don't you talk though about kind of the clinical applications of and implications yeah. for hermesis. Uh, talk about remote conditioning, which yeah. is kind of interesting. There's this story with this emerging on that. Right, so um, sometimes I get emails from lay people suggesting that they should take low levels of hydrogen peroxide to help them be stronger. And I always say I'm not an MD, you know, and I, you know, I, I don't recommend any sort of homeopath homeopathy. <laughs> could, at home you know, you could uh, drink high levels of hydrogen <laughs> peroxide and it'll cure your COVID. <laughs> Right, exactly. So, um, you know, the clinical applications of... We can oh, oh, by the way, that's a joke. <laughs> I'm, re I'm referring to our former um, president's yeah, yeah, comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we need to kind of, we need to use um, our knowledge of the molecular targets of preconditioning and not try to take low doses of any sort of toxicant, right? I just want to kind of make that clear for the audience. But as far as sort of natural things that engage those targets, you're right, it's certainly dietary fasting and exercise, perhaps sort, perhaps also sort of going about your daily activities of moving, you know, sort of getting up and out of your chair if you're not exercising a lot, but even that like in an elderly person is, you know, like getting up and going is going to be helpful. Um, and that, that relates to food scarcity because you have to move to find food, right? And all, all creatures have to do this. And so movement is sort of built into one of the needs of the system as is an exposure to a period of fasting every day and, um, and so forth. And that actually reminds me of your two deoxyglucose studies if you gave that during the animal's light cycle during the animal's life yeah. cycle, that's when it's not supposed to be eating anyway so that's good right and uh, then if yeah. you withdraw the stimulus during the dark phase then it can ingest Interesting. Yeah. And kind of build up strength yeah okay. so um just kind of back, circle back to the circadian rhythms but at any rate so the applications of um conditioning and preconditioning that's sort of been the the um critique of the field like how are you what are you going to do with this you're going yeah. to take hydrogen peroxide or something silly right. like that so um but there are applications of what is known as remote preconditioning with a blood pressure cuff as you had as i think you're bringing up and that is that if you apply a tourniquet around a limb such as a thigh or an upper arm and and cause a mild stress in that arm with deprivation from oxygen and glucose, for one thing, um, then you might allow that arm during, after you take the cuff off, to um, build resources to prepare for the next challenge. Because, okay, if you keep if you keep doing this every three days or every day, then the animal is going to start to, the, the, the tissues are gonna learn, this happens regularly, I better prepare for this. And so it's gonna upregulate defenses. And what's interesting about doing that in vivo is that you can release these substances outside of cells that um, go and tell other organs 
you know, okay, there is danger in the environment and you have to prepare yourself too because we're part of a unit. You know, and then the brain, of course, is also informed of the danger. The brain will also tell the other organs you need to prepare for the, for the, um, for the, for the next episode of this ischemia, if you will. And that actually reminds me that to talk a little bit more about heat shock protein 70, as you had asked before, and that is that this is also secreted into the extracellular space. And it is also sort of a danger signal that tells, because it's a stress-induced molecule. It's up when you shock the cells with the heat, as you had mentioned. So it's released into the extracellular space um, and tells other, could be telling other organs yeah. to prepare for danger. We tried, yeah. we tried to give heat shock protein 70 intranasally to protect against the synu fibro, the synuclein fibro model of Parkinson's disease. And we were able to get it into the brain in male mice and not in female mice and protect against um, one oh. aspect of the pathology. Those studies, unfortunately, were interrupted by the pandemic, <laughs> which Tarun was very bitter about. And he did, did a lot of work that we weren't able to fully publish because um, we weren't able to complete the study as planned. And before yeah. I forget, I wanted to also mention your, your episode of having, so I think the pandemic was similar to people having staying indoors too much we all planned to go outside and exercise more but everybody was just on zoom all the time and so a lot of people seem to have, at least in my among my friends seem to have gotten sort of depressed and inactive and just oh it's we're blaming it all on zoom but you know like with you you were used to being outdoors and having a high amplitude circadian rhythm every day so like very active at night therefore sleeping very deeply at daytime and you take that away it's not surprising that you felt you know blue right yeah, yeah. and so um i think that kind of feeds into this whole um yeah. story so back to the remote preconditioning i think so there have been clinical studies suggesting that it could be efficacious and as with all human studies because of the heterogeneity of the human population the results are very variable but there is some degree of promise with using um, remote preconditioning even in elderly patients which is always sort of the the uh you know the caveat of our animal work right yeah. unless you're using very old animals how do you protect elderly people who are more subject to the cumulative damage of life with the passage of time how do you protect those elderly people and i think it's also been successful in the people who are in their 80s and 90s to be um, protective. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know, and you can answer this question better than me, if when you exercise, you have mild ischemia. I doubt it, right? But because I think what probably happens is that the brain kind of says, hey, I've seen, I've seen this before, I better get more oxygen to the muscles. I don't know. But maybe at the cellular level, there is sort of very mild, you know, ischemia that then is sort of that then remote preconditioning has tapped into this ancient um, pathway. I'm not sure. There, there are several labs that um, have published papers uh, uh, providing evidence that there's <clears throat> certain molecules released from muscle cells in response to exercise that get into the brain and, and have beneficial effects on the brain. One is uh, called irisin. Hmm. Um, another was actually Henriette von Prague. She, she was in my laboratory, under me in my laboratory. She discovered that exercise enhances neurogenesis in the brain, uh, production of new nerve cells from stem cells in, in, in one region of the brain anyway, the hippocampus. And she had this finding that was really intriguing initially to say, what? She, she has evidence that cathepsin D yeah. is released from muscle cells and gets into the brain mm. and, and plays a role in, in stimulating neurogenesis. Wow. Now, now cathepsin D, it's, it's like an enzyme that's involved in 
kind of degrading other proteins. And so to me, it didn't make a lot of sense, but then she has like the nice story developing uh, how this the cells on muscle cells under the stress of exercise release this protein and goes to the brain and has a good effect. So it, um, with the, the remote conditioning, as you mentioned, so essentially you're shutting off the blood supply to your arm or your leg temporarily, uh, just enough to cause like some mild pain and scheme in. I don't know, I, I'm not sure what's been done in terms of identifying the molecules. That, I guess you can imagine at least two mechanisms. One, there's something released into the blood. Another is that the nervous system senses that actually in my understanding is in the studies have been done, including in humans, they, they shut off the blood supply enough so it's actually somewhat painful to the limb, I mean, your nervous system is responding to that. And there's these like retrograde signals that may go up uh, into the brain and, and elicit kind of stress responses in the brain that in theory could be uh, beneficial. Yeah, yeah. I actually have several questions for you. What's Irison named after? Just wondering. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I wonder if it was found in the eye or something like that. Oh, maybe it could be. I, I guess I should know that, but I don't. Oh, that's okay. Um, catepsin D is that in lysosomes? And yeah. I think that the lysosomes, so it's maybe there's sort of crosstalk between the exosomes that are going to be released and, oh. the, and the lysosomal. Yeah. Um, or you know a vesicle, and so it kind of pulls out some of the catepsin D and then releases it into the blood or or maybe it's just sort of passive damage to the muscles that's doing that's causing the sort of drooling <laughs> you know yeah. of the cells if you will and just some catepsin d goes into the brain and then why you know I, I i had a podcast with art kramer okay who's like an expert on effects of exercise on the brain yeah and so you mentioned these exosomes are these small extracellular vesicles are like 100 nanometers in diameter. And so our cells release these. And I pointed out to Art that, um, well, I asked him, actually, have you, have you um, looked at exosomes in the blood from people, you know, that exercise or not? And he hadn't. And, and the reason is that uh, a neurologist who was under me at NIH, Dimitros Kapagianis, developed a method to using an antibody that's specific for a protein in neurons. Uh, he isolated the total exosomes in the blood and then used the antibody to pull out the exosomes that are probably coming from neurons. Mm -hmm. And then he showed that he could um, get robust um, uh, biomarker, essentially, uh, diagnosis of early Alzheimer's disease from these exosomes. But yeah, it would be interesting to see whether uh, exosomes released from the muscle cells have cathepsin D in them. Yeah. One, and whether it's in theory possible those exosomes coming from the muscles could be targeted to the brain. Yeah. So anyway, we're kind of getting this is good. We're thinking about experiments. So yeah, yeah. As well. um, I bet there's a flood of exosomes coming out of damaged muscle. I mean, I, you'd I, think I, so, wouldn't you? I would, I would imagine. <laughs> it could be yeah. wrong. I would imagine. So I guess there's several possibilities. One is that it's freely diffusible molecules that are released. And the other is that they're membrane bound through exosomes. And maybe the exosomes are even helpful for substances that don't cross the blood brain barrier. You have the lipid. Um, yeah you know, yeah. the lipid will allow fusion with the blood-brain barrier and then release into the central nervous system. That makes me actually wonder about the areas that are have don't have a very tight blood-brain barrier, like, you know, the arcuate nucleus and the hypothalamus, I think, and then there's a the subfornical organ, and then there's the area post-strema. So those are maybe 
also recipients of those freely diffusible substances that are not within exosomes. But that's interest, it's interesting to me that you have this means of communication between organs that people didn't really appreciate. And I would imagine that that's again tapped into to tell the brain what's going on peripherally. You know, yeah. neuroscientists always kind of like to think with the brain and only the brain, <laughs> right? I mean, I know I do that all the time. Sure, we, you know, when we do our experiments with rats and mice and after we euthanize them, we, we essentially yeah. cut the head off, take the brain out and, yeah. you know, throw the body away and, yeah. and vice versa. People who work on other organ systems yeah. don't pay any attention to the brain. Only resources could be pooled a little bit better. Yeah, that's true. Like There's Every animal that's sacked to take the whole body, freeze it down or whatever you'd have to do. To kind there of has to be a lot of coordination between yeah. laboratories and... Yeah. Uh, in an ideal world, that would be good. It, you know, it'd save animals. We'd have to use less animals, yeah. And um, which is important. And um, yeah, but it's kind of hard in 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 the typical where people are in a department or whatever. Yeah, yeah. To yeah. to like coordinate that. Yeah, I always yeah. think of researchers in academia, sort of independent contractors that uh, right. like a small business person, you know, just kind of running your own lab and living <laughs> in a little bit of a silo. But yeah. I certainly don't have all the answers about remote conditioning and whether it will become a, a standardized tool yeah. to use in the clinic, perhaps before people undergo heart surgery or maybe any other kind of surgery to kind of prepare them for what's to come. You know, that needs to be studied in, uh, in a studied, I think, um, together with intermittent fasting, because I think there are some groups who have looked at kind of withdrawing calories to prepare for surgery. Um, yeah, 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 there's, there's quite a bit, that's very promising. Uh, and um, what was I gonna say? No, I forgot because it wasn't. It was on a different angle on this. Um, yeah, I th that that's actually being used, I think, in the clinic. Okay, I didn't know. That. You know, it, w for surgeries, right? They and I've had multiple surgeries because I did mountain bike accident. You know, they tell you fast overnight. Well, you know, part of that has to do with they don't want your stomach full and. Right under anesthesia, but actually that's probably in itself a beneficial thing to do from the standpoint of the recovery of, of the cells. Obviously when you're, you do surgery, you're damaging tissue. Um, and so that's, yeah, it's, it's very possible that the fasting could kind of put the cells in a, a more of a stress resistance pro resilient kind of mode. Yeah. yeah, I think the main thing with modern life is that we don't live, that we we haven't lived this sort of a lifestyle for long enough, you know, to have adapted to it. And I don't know that that's a problem. I think sort of prehistorically what we were subjected to, which was a lot of stress. I mean, life was nasty, brutish and short, <laughs> you yeah. know, as they say, um, you know, that's kind of what we, the, what we are expected to be subjected to. And without it, you have the modern lifestyle. Yes. Although I have to say, you know, there's this um, Ötzi um, cadaver that they found from thousands of years ago in the Swiss Alps. So many years ago, they found um, a mummified corpse that was buried in the Alps. And they've looked at him over the course of many years and they found that he also had um you know atherosclerosis and lyme disease and you know other things that were sort of unexpected because we sort we do sort of romanticize the you know the livestock sort of living and living in at one with nature <laughs> and all of that the other stuff but you know he was killed he was murdered um from behind and so I guess we have to be grateful for what, you know, living. Well, it's, it's hard to say, though, because that particular person, for example, could have had a, 
mutation in the LDL receptor or, That's true. you That's know, true. there's, yep. there's genetic, uh, most cases of atherosclerosis um, and early onset coronary artery disease, they're not necessarily genetic, but yeah. there are cases where, yeah. you know, it's clearly inherited in a family. It's independent of diet, but the people are eating healthy and they just have a genetic predisposition. Yeah. But what but what is clear, unambiguous, that uh, people with uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, they have shorter lives on average and they have a lot of uh, medical issues with the cardiovascular system, increased risk for stroke, even um, increased risk for certain cancers. Uh, you know, all of the diseases that are the major causes of death. So in that setting, my way of looking at that is that people don't exercise and they're, you know, they're eating something during their entire waking hours, pretty much. Yeah. Then their cells become complacent. These, these adaptive stress response pathways we've been talking about that enhance DNA repair, autophagy, um, and probably optimize uh, bioenergetics and induce intercellular, interorganellar signaling. Those are, are not being engaged and, and so the cells become more vulnerable yeah. to stress. It, it makes yeah. a lot of sense. It, it, it reminds me of the word um, that you used in a review rather, a, a few times. You used the word overindulgent. It made me feel guilty. Right? <laughs> 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 I was like, oh, okay, overindulgent at any rate. I think there was one article, I can't remember which journal was, but which journal it was. I think it was a journal of obesity or something. And they didn't want me to use that word because they Yeah, right. Somehow they they thought that wasn't a nice It might offend someone. <laughs> might offend, but I don't know. Yeah, and they didn't want me to use uh say the, that per person is obese, they want me to say that person has obesity. I, I, I don't know. It was yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> but now obesity was, I guess, officially recognized as a disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, um, okay, let's see. Well, you should play, you should uh, promote your book that's behind you, the Hormesis. Well, <laughs> I should actually write a book. Uh, maybe you have time to write one with me. Sure. <laughs> I'm writing, so I'd I'd like to help you with that. Yeah. I've I've got another book. So I had the the intermittent fasting book came out earlier this year. Did you know about that? No. No. Give you a chance to show it. There we go. Okay. Yeah, and so this is on the science. It covers everything, evolution, um, different, you know, mechanisms, organ systems, sp studies in models of disease, um, practical things, um, advice for physicians. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of different things. Yeah, there isn't this book on hormesis. So it's a collection of articles. Actually, I'm an author on a lot of the articles. Um, it's not really a monograph, mm -hmm. but it, it's good. But I think something that's more, I guess lay people can understand this book pretty well, but there's a lot of things in there that get lost in them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well. Yeah, so I've written two books, the intermittent fasting one, and one that's at, the, that's at the publisher now. It's called Sculptor and Destroyer, Tales of Glutamate, the Brain's Most Important Neurotransmitter. Ah, okay. And which is a, yeah, yeah. it's a, a lot, but it's important, I think. Yeah. Um, actually, glutamate is a stressor. Yeah. Our, our cells, it's the main excitatory transmitter, so it is the neurotransmitter that's imposing a lot of good stress on our cells, 
neurons, but if the neurons are subjected to glutamate when they're under conditions like in a stroke, where there's reduced blood supply, or perhaps during aging where repair mechanisms are downregulated, then the cells become vulnerable to being damaged by glutamate. It's a really probably from the standpoint of the brain, the best example of, of uh, hormesis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Do you think that people who take monosodium glutamate? Ah. Um, so the monosodium glutamate, it doesn't get into your brain at okay. significantly high levels. Okay. There was some current, some concern with pregnant women mm. who take monosodium glutamate, but there was never, never any epidemiological evidence to support any adverse effects on their, their children on, on brain development. Um, the other thing is when glutamate is released at a synapse, it's rapidly removed by astrocytes. I mean. yeah. So if you take glutamate in an animal and you inject it into the brain, it doesn't really cause much damage because it's rapidly mm -hmm. removed. Yeah. However, there are, there are toxins, naturally occurring toxins that are unable to be, that activate glutamate receptors, but these toxins such as canic acid, Demoic acid, they can't be removed by the glucose transporters that normally transport glucose from outside the cells into the astrocytes. So I guess the bottom line is no, I, I wouldn't worry about monosodium glutamate. Yeah, I think actually from what I have um, read that the, the studies that have been done telling people here's some MSG versus here's some placebo, people can't really tell the difference. They feel bad. <laughs> they all feel okay. bad, but it could also- Oh, interesting. But I didn't know that it didn't go, that it did not go into the brain. It's interesting that we have a taste receptor for this umami flavor in food. Well, but that's on your tongue. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, um, one person who, who you, whose books you might like is called Harold McGee. He writes about kitchen science, and he wrote a long time ago about the, the animals that are, I'm sorry, plants that are stressed making substances to defend themselves, and that... Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He wrote about that a long time ago, and he was... He, of course, um, is a, um, an author who has kind of taught himself chemistry of cooking. I don't know that he writes much anymore. He used to have a column for the New York Times. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Um, there is some evidence that uh, organic foods, that, that, that plants that aren't exposed to pesticides, okay? Yeah. They produce higher levels of their naturally occurring pesticides which are things like caffeine yeah. uh, and, and some plants, nicotine, um, sulforaphane, and so on. So, and, and another, other studies have shown that um, like if you take plants and like put them under drought conditions, uh, yeah. at levels where they're still surviving, they kind of concentrate stress molecules in them. Um, yeah, so these are yeah. adaptive mechanisms of the plants that some of them may benefit us indirectly. Yeah, yeah. You know, in the grocery store, what you buy are these plants that are designed for transportation, you know, and they probably don't have too many of those chemicals because of all the sort of the the selection for plants that will have. Oh, that's true. Buying, too. You know what I mean? And so buying. Yeah, the, the genetic, the genetic. Uh, yeah. I don't have a problem with any of that, except to say that a lot of the fruits taste like cardboard compared to like wild strawberries and things like that. And I think that tells us something about the nutrient. Well, well it's interestingly from health standpoint in general, bitter is better. Yeah, yeah. And but a lot of people don't like bitter tasting things. And well, children don't like bitters. And I think that's because they should not. Ah. Like, you know, that makes sense to me because yeah. they have not been trained to know what's safe. 
And yeah. so, you know, what I noticed in my daughters is they hated bitter stuff as young children. As they grew older, they could stand to eat salads and vegetables more, not just because they learned that it was safe, but I think sort of people kind of grow out of that eventually, you know, um, but babies, like toddlers in the forest should not just randomly eat bread. No, no. You know? So yeah, that, that makes sense. That, that makes sense that they don't like bitters when they're young. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's okay. lots to talk about. We can catch up again later, and we can talk about writing a book together, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this has been great, Rihanna, and we covered a lot of ground, and hopefully this will give people a lot of food for thought, particularly bitter-tasting food. Yeah, um, just just to kind of let the audience know, we speculated a lot <laughs> today. So. Yeah, well, that's okay. This is an example of two scientists kind of kibitzing. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's the way science works. Yep, yep. Okay, Rihanna. Yeah, thank you. Thank Great you. to talk with you. Take care, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.